It's gonna ask you about that. You'll start sending me texts at you know two in the morning. Where's my basketball court? I was gonna ask you about that, but we've been so busy on these meetings. But well, hopefully today will be a little less a little less busy. So it looks like a fairly short agenda uh, with all the continuations, but maybe Aaron has a few surprises hitting in there. There's a couple, but I think we can move through it pretty quickly. Okay, so I have seven, so why don't we get going? And so welcome everyone. Today is Wednesday, January 9th, 2021, and this is our bi-weekly meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Um, so first on the agenda is me, and the primary topic I wanted to bring up today is just um, composition of the committee, of the commission. And so I am um, terming out, and Larry, I don't know if you're just leaving or terming out, and then, well, I, I don't, I was, no, I'm, I'm turning out. I was a two-year appointment. Okay. Uh, and then Fletcher, you're probably gone pretty soon. I don't know how I got off before you, but. I got slipped in for another three-year term like last year. Hmm. And I said, yes. Okay. Um, and so we are having a couple of meetings, the 17th, I believe, Aaron. Uh, for people who are interested in coming on. So there will be some fresh blood coming on. I assume we are interviewing multiple people, Aaron. I don't know. I know it's just one or more. I was just told to yeah. block it out. I'm not sure how multiple many. people, yes. Okay, so uh, we're looking for at least two people. Um, and then Aaron also reached out to me and Larry about us staying on just so that we can finish up some unfinished business. There will always be some continuations. Um, the big ones right now being Tofino, really. Uh, to yeah. Try to finish that one up. Um, can't, and I think, you know, that's going to be what it's going to be. And then, um, yeah, poor farm would be nice to get that over with as well. But we'll see. Uh, but hopefully that'll all be done early July. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I think August, I want to say August 1 was the deadline for Canton. Um, and uh, we have like another continuance on Pomeroy, but Tofino is another story, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of plan for people. Um, at that point, I assume that Jen will be taking over as chair. And so we'll <laughs> also be looking for a co-chair as well. But um, that's not a... You know, you don't need to do it at that point, Jen, but you know, if you're so- I'm interested. sorry, I just had a big toddler distraction. So wait, Brett and Larry are leaving? Is that what I just heard? You're um, like leaving, leaving, Brett? Uh, I am being kicked off, yes. So. <gasps> well, not, yeah, could I just clarify? So the, the, I think the town's, it's not a written policy, but it's it's pretty, they, they stick pretty, pretty straight to it, which is if you have two consecutive three-year terms, then in order to have turnover and new new people join committees and boards, then they they move you off. So they don't reappoint the, whether it's a town manager appointment, reappointment or a council reappointment. <laughs> so that's okay. where, so you can take a year off and then apply with a, 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 a another you know an application and be reappointed. So um, yeah. that's always a possibility. So that doesn't apply to me. That doesn't yeah. apply to me. Because I'm on a one, one two-year term. Yeah, that's interesting, Larry. I'm going to ask the town manager about you because you you filled. I filled in for somebody as in a, in a term with two years left. Yeah. Would you, well, let me ask you this: If they considered that differently, would you stay on? Sure. Okay. Let me talk to the town manager about that because, um, yeah. Let me let me just check into that. Because continuity, continuity is so important, you know, on these on planning board, concom, ZBA, et cetera. Yeah, and I think I am at term limits. And so, yeah, Dave's right. I'm not getting kicked off by any means. Um, but yeah, I'm not eligible for reappointment is a nicer way to say it. Sorry. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about the rehash. So, um, yeah, so I don't think we need to vote this time, but we might want to think for next time um, who we want to be chair. Uh, Jen's the obvious person, um, and who we want to be co-chair, and then we can move forward on that. Any other questions or comments about succession planning, all that sort of stuff? Well, yeah. Is it on the website about your the um, expiration? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Your your terms are on the website. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, I just have to look at what mine is. We try to in like two years. Yeah, you know, we try not to have commission members expire. Just um, retire. <laughs> it expires is a tough word there, Dave. So, um, right, yeah, do you I think we're normally in a three-year appointment, but could we say something just about meetings as well? Um, you know, with the governor's order, this is my understanding. <laughs> Um, so the clock is ticking toward June 15th. As of June 15th, we officially in Massachusetts, we can no longer, unless the legislature passes special legislation, we can no longer have remote meetings. It would violate the open meeting law. So if nothing happens by the 15th, um, any meeting after that would need to be in person. Now we fully expect the legislature to do something. And we hope we're hoping because we we at the town level and many committees and boards have found this to be really much more convenient. Frankly, the participation across the board in Amherst has been dramatically increased by doing remote meetings. It's made it easier on staff, it's made it easier on you all and many other committees and boards to around um, you know, family, family um, you know, situations, children, daycare, you name it, jobs, <laughs> et cetera. So we're really hoping that the legislature doesn't do something like, oh, extend it to September 1, that's nice. We're kind of hoping they might make it law, but we don't know if that's gonna happen. So um, we don't know if anything will happen by next, what is that next Wednesday? But um, so we're going to post the next meeting as both virtual and in person, and let's see what the legislature does. So Dave, I was talking to someone who's on Northampton City Council today, and they said that they, they were told they're not going back in person until September. Where would they have been getting that? If the governor does, if the legislature doesn't pass that extension, they can't do that. It's not legal. That's what I thought. Okay, thank no. you. Yeah. So, and so then, Dave, do do you know what the town's plan would be? Let's assume that it is passed. Will it still be fully remote or will it be a hybrid model? That's a good question, Brad. We're talking about that a little bit. Um, yeah. Hybrid, you know, we, you know, hybrid is challenging. I mean, we can do it. It's a problem. We can do it, um, but we can't do it for all the committees and boards in Amherst. There's over 50 committees and boards. And so, it would, it would have to be kind of parsed out to those that we can kind of afford to have the IT support for and, and the technology for. Like you, you all meet in the town room because basically, historically, who's met in the town room? The, the select board and now, of course, the council, the planning board, the CONCOM, and the ZBA. Other committees and boards normally don't meet in the town room. That is our best equipped room. Um, there's one other room on the first floor on, in town hall, which I think we've we've all met in before, which is tighter. If you have a large group, how do you fit them in there? Um, so it's hard for us to consider doing hybrid for 50 committees and boards, but I think we're going to have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But um, so I'm hoping I'm hoping the legislature does something like says we're going to pass this through next year or something like that and give everybody a little uh, room to breathe. So we'll through Aaron you'll you'll find out here in the next four or five working days what what the legislature has done between now and the 15th at least. And so assuming that we do have that the town's looking for some input does anybody on the commission have feelings about if we did have the option, if we should be hybrid or fully one or the other? Zoom. I don't think hybrid works. Yeah, so Brett, we did kind of talk about this at the end of the last meeting, um, just because it was like, felt like a pressing issue and we wanted to just create space to kind of voice opinions. Um, and I think it was fair to say that everyone was supportive of maintaining some remote option. Now, Laura didn't um, get a chance to chime in on that, and I don't want to step, you know. No, no I, I'm totally supportive of that. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think Brett, everyone was kind of like, "Why not?" Mm -hmm. If that, you know, um, especially because it's actually more accessible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yeah. 
Okay, cool. I did see the beginning of the meeting when there was some discussion, but I missed that last part. So I did review yeah. the most of the recording, not all of it. But. Yeah, fair. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that, yeah, we had a chance to kind of weigh in. And that's of my opinion. Granted, I'm going to be off soon anyways. Um, I think that makes sense. Um, we actually have somebody from the uh, audience who would like to speak. So, uh, Johanna, uh, you should be able to speak now. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My name is Johanna Newman. I live at 137 Stanley Street. I um, I just wanted to quickly check the agenda and see if the discussion of the parking lot about uh, at, at Stanley Street is on the agenda for tonight or if I made a mistake. No, you are correct. And that is, uh, we are slated to actually talk about that. And so whatever time is on the agenda, we cannot start it before then. Got it. Uh, but hopefully we will be able to start it. And that one is at 740. 740. So Great. Yep. Thank you. You are welcome. <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, with that, unless there's any more discussion on that piece, why don't we go over to Dave for your update? Aaron, can you share a couple of slides? I think Aaron's going to. Yes, should be queuing up right now. Yeah. Can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yep. Yes. Great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be fairly brief here. But yeah, just wanted to give you a couple of updates on, on things that uh, we talked a little bit about last week or two weeks ago. Um, we have started the work on the, the cribbing, uh, replacing the cribbing at Puffer's Pond uh, with, with the, the commission's uh, uh, blessing two weeks ago. We are doing a modest replacement of, of some of the rotted cribbing. These are old uh, railroad ties up, up at Puffer's Pond. We are not doing all of them. That is a really large and expensive project, um, but we're just, we're basically trying to short, <laughs> um, pun intended, shore things up uh, around the pond edge on the South Beach, that's the State Street side, and um, at the at the with the increased cost of uh, uh, pressure treated lumber, um, yeah, I think it's going to be quite a modest uh, improvement up there. But uh, Brad and his, his summer staff have already started the project, and it's mainly a safety thing to get some of the old cribbing out. The cribbing is uh, is uh, in with rebar in the ground with rebar. So when, when the, the old cribbing rots, the rebar is exposed and therefore you get kind of a safety issue. So it's gonna be a pretty modest uh, redo of, of some of that work up there. Um, let's see, in terms of, I'll come back to this, this uh, image on the screen. The water testing has begun up at Puffer's Pond and, went, um, and Wentworth Farm at Stanley Street. Um, we had some good reports, uh, good, good uh, data come back from Puffer's Pond last week, and the pond was fine. Unfortunately, the, the, um, the samples from Wentworth Farm, this is in the Fort River at Stanley Street, the so-called Jump Bridge, came back today, and no big surprise, you know, with the rain, um, the levels of E. coli in the Fort River are higher than, um, higher than the state recommends uh, in terms of, of public safety. So we are gonna post uh, Jump Bridge, uh, should have been posted today, if not today, tomorrow. So unfortunately, um, we do have to put up warnings there and we, we'd recommend people not swim in the Fort River. I will say that we are, I'm working with Beth Gettle from DPW, Brian Yellen from the Fort River Watershed and we've, we've already begun to do some more comprehensive water testing as a town and working with the nonprofit uh, Fort River Watershed Association group that Brian heads up to try to get a better handle on what's going on with the E. coli in the, in the Fort River. Um, there's speculation, there's some historical data, but we've never really taken a comprehensive look upstream of the Fearing Brook. Uh, we got some new data this spring that Kind of leads us upstream a little bit. Uh, we really were, we were blaming the Fearing Brook on a lot of the problem, and we think the problem might originate, at least in part, um, further upstream. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna continue to look into that, and I will I will update you as we get more data on that. Um, the Fearing Brook floodplain restoration project, which is um, you know right down in that area, and um, the Fort River. Um, 
Port River Farm Conservation Area. Um, bids, bids, uh, the bid documents have been out. The, um, the, uh, we're expecting responses in the next couple of weeks. Beth Gettle is kind of spearheading that. That was kind of a carryover for her from her time as a wetlands administrator. And she's in touch with Aaron and myself and Stephanie Ciccarello on that. But we had a site visit yesterday and four or five contractors were there. Uh, so I think there's, there's robust interest in, in bidding on that floodplain restoration project. What's the time frame on for that project? We would be under construction, hopefully mid to late August, um, early September at the latest. But trying to do it, you know, certainly before any significant rain in October. So it's not a huge project. I think it could go fairly quickly. Um, but we want to be under construction during low low flow if we can. Maybe if things turn around quickly, maybe even second week of August. So that's ideal. Um, let's see, and then finally jumping back to, I, I had talked to you about a, a little preview of some of the work that we're proposing and will be part of an NOI at Sweet Alice Conservation Area. I'm not sure if if we can get any more detail. Is this the only slide, uh, Aaron, or is there another slide? Um, so I have the larger um, plan set. Um, would the map, would your map, your map might be sufficient. I, I, I don't think we need to go. Did you have your map of the trail? Um, is that easy to get? Let me see. I think that's kind of a, a good overview. Um, Um, sorry about that. No, that's all right. I was thinking you wanted to show the actual plans that, um, shoot, I'm having trouble putting my finger on that one. Um, I don't know what I, I well, maybe we just go back to what you got there. If you could zoom, zoom in on. Sure. Um, and we'll start. So there are four areas that we're going to propose um, four areas of work to propose at the Sweet Alice Conservation Area adjacent to Epstein Pond. So this is just a quick preview of the NOI that'll be coming to you in the, the next meeting or two. Um, recall that we embarked on this collaborative project with the Kestrel Trust um, four or five years ago to preserve um, the pond at the so-called Epstein uh, property. I'm not sure we're going to continue to call it the Epstein Pond, but for now the Epstein Pond um, and we are working in partnership with the Kestrel Trust to try to activate the trail, in particular one loop around the pond. That Most of that trail has been established and frankly was maintained by Mr. Epstein for the last 50 years. Um, but those areas had some rather informal and, um, and uh, underperforming uh, crossings for wetlands and or streams. So we have, we've identified four areas that we'd like to improve to kind of bring this into a better compliance and make it easier for people to use. And of course, less impactful on, on the resource area. The first, the first is area one, uh, we're, we're proposing to install some simple wooden steps um, in, in the slope connecting um, actually two driveways. One is a driveway for the Kestrel Trust and we've gotten permission from the abutter to the east to include um, uh, part of their driveway as part of a trail out to uh, improve parking out on um, Bay Road. And so that is area one, and that uh, crosses near to a small wetland. Um, the trail itself is already being informally used, but we wanna make sure to kind of um, concentrate uh, use in that area so that people are not damaging the wetland to the north. The second area is a very small uh, stream crossing on the old part of the old, I, what I believe is the part of the old trolley line that connected Amherst to, um, to um, uh, South Hadley. It, uh, if it's not, it may, be, it may be part of that. I'm not sure. I'd have to go, I need to ground truth that a little bit. But suffice it to say, it's a very small crushed culvert um, that, um, we would like to improve with some sort of a simple crossing there. It might be as simple as a bog bridge um, to the east 
in this in this drawing, and we'll have more detail for you in a couple of weeks, is really kind of a small wetland area, a small seep, and that water moves to the east right into the, the pond itself. And really, people have been just walking through the mud, walking over the crushed culvert. We want to make sure nobody breaks their leg or breaks an ankle on that culvert. It's, so uh, it's kind of dangerous, uh, that area at this point. The third area, um, the third area is something we want to include in this NOI, but we may not do right away. It's probably, it is the most extensive uh, work and the most extensive crossing. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you have hiked at all up on the Mount Holyoke Range, but there's just a myriad of trails up on the Mount Holyoke Range. And some of them are on town land, some of them are on uh, DCR land, state land, and some of them are on uh, land owned by the other communities and some are on private land. So this third area actually turns out to be on town land, but it connects the trail system up to the Mount Holyoke Range State Park trails. And uh, right now, and we'll have photos to, to kind of follow this at the next meeting um, or when we present the NOI, of course, but uh, this is a, a really kind of a mud fest there's a very informal substandard crossing over, over a very nice uh, cold water stream. And uh, we're proposing um, a, a boardwalk and a, a, an improved crossing um, with kind of much sta more stable um, uh, bank uh, approaches to that crossing. So we think this will be a huge improvement. Concentrate uh, foot traffic on the, the bridging itself. And I think we're going to try, if we can afford to do this with helical piers, we're going to try to do it uh, with helical piers. This will probably be a phase two, but we wanted to include it in the NOI to get it permitted now. The last piece, which is we call uh, piece uh, or area four, will be included in, in the first phase of work. Um, right now, it's showing a much longer boardwalk. And Aaron and I talked about this earlier. Um, we don't believe that boardwalk is necessary, nor can we afford it at this point. The area where Aaron's cursor is, is actually an area where there's two crushed culverts in, a, in an absolutely beautiful cold water stream. And um, Mr. Epstein, I'm sure put those in there 40, 50 years ago, and they have not been functioning for as many years as I've been going there, which is, which is a lot. And so we're proposing to remove those crushed culverts, stabilize the banks, and put a simple walking bridge over that, that, that small stream. So that is gonna be a, a huge improvement for um, fish, fish passage, um, for any, any critters that use uh, either the aquatic habitat or the, the, the uh, upland habitat on either side. And it's gonna be much less impactful um, on the resource area. Um, as a matter of fact, we did a couple of times we've been there, we actually have seen brook trout trying to get up through the culverts and they absolutely can't, you know, they're, they're, they're crushed and they're full of sediment and other, other detritus. So we think this will be a huge improvement and this will all kind of um, complete a, a, a much improved loop trail around the pond uh, in partnership with Kestrel. So that's kind of just a brief um, preview of this NOI that we're putting together now uh, with, with Brad, Aaron, uh, Berkshire Design is, is uh, doing some of the drawings for us and uh, Art Allen did some of the wetland, did the wetland delineation for us. So any questions on that? Again, we'll, we'll have lots of photos and of course a site visit uh, coming up uh, when the NOI is filed with you. Dave, did you say, um... I, you might have said this last time, but do you, are, is the town planning on doing the construction um, for the bridges? A good, that's a good question, Fletcher. One of the one of the, the 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 things that Aaron I think brings to these projects with all of her experience is, you know, some great ideas. And one of hers was if we hired Berkshire Design on a very simple and very inexpensive contract. And part of the reason we did that was Aaron's prompting to say, let's get some standard designs for the conservation department so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time we do a bog bridge or a, you know, there, there's unique aspects to bridges for sure. Um, but if we can get a standard design that you like and that we can recreate around town, um, 
then Brad can simply do some of the work himself with his crew, or in certain cases when Brad is, is really full up with work, uh, we can just hire a, um, you know, a, 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 a local contracting crew to come in there and do this. And, you know, these are not, putting these together is not really rocket science, but it, you do need a plan to follow. And so there's some great carpenters, some small shops in Amherst in the region that we'd be happy to put some business out there and, and get some people to come in. And, and of course they would work with Aaron uh, within the resource areas to, to do a good project and protect the, the resources. So. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good idea. I was wondering why you had, you were hiring an engineering firm for this, but now it makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. Well, the other thing is they, they afforded, a, they were able to put arts plans their arts uh, delineations and then the plans together are really sure. for us. So again, kudos to Aaron for bringing these two firms together in a very reasonable price. And, and here we are. Nice. So we'll, we'll see more detail on that in a couple of weeks. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say at this point. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions for Dave? Erin, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so this is a, um, we, we are, we are using our new, our new um, permit application system for land use applications, which is very exciting. Um, and this is what our new um, applications look like when they come in. Um, so we received this request um, for a wedding on Mount Pollux on um, September 18th at three o'clock, 15 participants. They want to have a small bus bring people up. Uh, no signage, no vegetation impacts, 15 chairs and two tables. Um, kind of have a standard, they have to acknowledge the rules and regulations and um, basically acknowledge that they're cleaning up um, after themselves as part of the application now, um, cleaning up all the material that they bring on site. So yeah, that's uh, the request that's come through. Okay, and they have nothing about a rain date or anything, Erin? No. So rain or shine, I guess. So, okay. Um, and that's it, they're not like bringing a band. No, you know, I mean, we can- 15 people, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we Chairs can certainly condition, I mean, we kind of have our standard boilerplate conditions that we've s sort of established for this. Um, it comes with like rules and regulations attached to it, um, but you know, make it clear that, you know, the town doesn't do any specific um setup for any event um and that they have to share it with the public obviously yeah if i could brett i mean having having seen dozens and dozens of these through the years i mean this seems like a very reasonable proposal the size you know, Aaron set up this uh, with Mike Warner from our IT department, created this new form and this new application uh, process. And again, as Aaron said, they they get follow up information from her if the commission decides to uh, uh, approve this application. And um, I believe they actually get a permit, correct, Aaron, that I sign off on that they can show anybody if they ask, oh, do you have permission to be up here? They have a signed, you know, uh, permit uh, that that you have authorized, in essence, authorized me to sign, and there it is. Yep. Um, this seems like a reasonable size. Um, yeah, no, no, no real bells and whistles. It's kind of kind of nice. Um, we we generally try not to have vehicles go up to the top of Mount Pollock, so only in extenuating circumstances uh, would we allow a vehicle to be up at the top. We get into kind of liability issues. Um, I have made exceptions in the past when we we had people with disabilities that needed to get up at the top, but um, it means some staff person has to be there, which is can be challenging on weekends. Um, I will say Angela Mills from my office was on Mount Pollux today. 
and said it was it was absolutely stunning up there. Uh, everything had been freshly mowed. She did not see one piece of trash or any any uh, refuse of any kind, which was just nice to hear. So it's it's in beautiful condition right now. And Small I assume that one of the conditions will be that the state of the grounds will be as they are, because I'm sure like some people would like it to be freshly mowed before, but that just happens when it happens. Yeah, we do make that clear um, that we cannot, you know, that used to be the case when I first started, people would call on a Saturday morning and say the grass is a foot long and I'm afraid of ticks or poison <laughs> ivy. And if you choose Mount Pollux, you know, it's, it's a it's it's an old orchard and wonderful views, but it's you know it's not uh, the Boltwood Inn. So um, yeah, you got to take it as as it comes. Okay. And insurance, Dave. Uh, are there any issues with liability? Because I know if it was a for profit, they'd obviously have to have their own insurance. But we're good. Yeah, we haven't done that for weddings in the past. Um, yeah. you know, so Excellent. I, I'm pretty comfortable on that. Okay. And I'm sorry, Anna. I think you were trying to say something. Oh, I was just. Just making sure small bus can mean a, a couple different things. So I wasn't sure they said that their par their parking needs that they're going to try to have a small bus, and I just wanted to make sure that was not not raising any red flags for any of you. In which case, I trust you and not worried. So what are you thinking that it is, if it's not a real small? Well, bus? I was like small, but I mean like one of the half buses, and is that I'm I'm guessing mm -hmm. they would just back back down if they can't turn around, or is that like we're not, so we're not worried. Well, you know, it, it doesn't imply they're going to take the bus all the way to the top. They said they parking, bring parking. Bring people in with a bus. I think, Aaron, the Aaron, you know, Aaron could communicate that to the applicant that they need to scout this out. We need to trust that they, you know, they know Mount Pollux or they're going to yeah. scout it out. And the size, you know, they only have 15 participants. So are they getting one of those mini buses or, you know, one of those kind right. of um, limoed, you know, small buses for an event like this? And you know they need to they need to do some measuring up there to make sure they can turn around but they'll just get in the parking lot and they're going to have to make a a 20 point turn to get it back down uh as long as that's not on us at all then all right great perfect and it could be more challenging for them if all those spaces are taken at that point which is right that'll be what it'll be yep so I don't know. Uh, yeah besides that uh yeah i don't see any issues here does anybody else have any problems with this one or we're not going to have our conservation commission retreat there that day. Mm. Nope. I was going to ask you joke. a wedding. Sorry. Okay. Um, so looking for a motion to approve um, this application for use in Mount Pollux. I move we approve the application for land or the land use application for Mount Pollux on September 18th at 3 p.m. for a wedding. Yep, I second that. Okay. Fletcher? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. And I for me as well. Okay. So next, Darren. Um, minutes. And so these are the minutes from last meeting and kudos for getting them together so quickly. So, yeah, I'm trying to catch up on minutes. Uh, I didn't get through as many sets this week, but um, I'm going to continue to chip away at them. <laughs> so, Has everybody read it? I have. Can I make a motion to approve the minutes of May 26, 2021? Second. Okay. So, Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Sorry. And I recused myself since I wasn't there. Um, so do you want to move into hearings? Do you want to cover other business? We, I mean, it's we've got a bunch of continuations. Um, it's really up to you guys. Yeah, why don't we see if we can get through our hearings? And so, yeah, the first few okay. will have to be continuations, and we'll see what time we're at at that point. Okay, fair enough. Um, so for 214 um, Pomeroy, again, they've requested another extension. Um, this is a month extension to July 7th. 
um, you know, I, it, this is completely fine. And obviously, you know, that there was confusion, I think, with this application um, when Stephanie was covering for me. And so I, you know, this is kind of exceptional, but I just want to say we've been having a lot of issues with people just continuing and continuing and continuing. And um, the problem that I see as a staff person is, you know, if you don't have staff, um, commissioners participating in the hearings, then they have to go back and view the, t view the tapes or um, they can't vote. And um, like Tofino being a good example, uh, we're basically two, two years in on continuations and um, the railroad project coming up soon is also another issue. So I think we should potentially consider on some of these that have been ongoing to set a deadline for the continuations, but that's, I'll leave that to you guys to um, make that decision. I'm just worried we're gonna have a meeting where there's like 30 hearings because <laughs> they're all piling up. And then the other issue is gonna be when a few of us um, time out. And exactly. So yep. at that point, yeah, Larry and I will be gone. And for some of them, there are people who need to recuse themselves for like Tofino. Yeah. So that's gonna be challenging. So that should probably be relayed to these people that yep. even if we don't have a deadline, they're going to run into issues here pretty soon. I will um, definitely let them know about that issue and let them know that we need to get this project reviewed and and through the door. <laughs> yeah, and related to that, Aaron, it'd be good for Larry and I to know how long we should be planning to stay on for. So. Um, yeah, I agree. And um, I mean, uh, Shall we say through July? Just to... Well, that's it's. Uh, I I guess I will leave it to you guys to make that determination. One of my what, and this is this is one of my concerns. And Tofino is going to be the sort of elephant in the room on this. Is that their mm -hmm. hearing is is picking back up again on the twenty third of June, and um, I already know that there is going to be a dispute about our peer reviewers. Um, changing of flag locations, they're going to try to um, dispute that and say they don't want to accept those. And um, I'm very concerned on the trajectory of that particular one. Um, mm -hmm. I've already I've already kind of gotten into it with the applicant, like them saying, well, it's the commission's fault that this has gone on so long. And I'm like, we've got literally like 10 requests for continuation from them um, and then sort of stalled revisions and stuff um, getting to us and missed the window for the Vernal Pool review. So um, I'm just concerned because I don't really know what's gonna happen with that. And I feel like we, there's a potential for that to be dragged on after the 23rd of June, so. Yep, and then Larry and I, I mean, we need a sort of, we should have a hard date. It's not fair to the new people coming on. It's probably right. okay for Larry and I, I can't speak for Larry. I can stay on for a little while, but particularly people. Do, anyway. <laughs> and hopefully Larry's staying on anyways, so. But, um. Yeah, I mean, I think for safety reasons, I would say maybe August 1st, but it's really up to you guys and up to the town to decide on that. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and, at least for me, Aaron, why don't we say that? And if you want to get that approved by the town, and then we can relay that to whoever needs to know for what it's worth to them. Okay. Fine, with me. Fine with me. Okay. Okay, well, all that being said, um, 214 Pomeroy Lane has requested a continuation to um, July 7th at 730. Okay. Are you looking for a motion? Yep. All yes, right. please. Uh, I move to continue the public hearing for 214 Pomeroy Lane to July 7th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Okay, voice vote. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Dave. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Aye for me as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. So uh, on to the next one is the railroad. And again, this is, this is another one that's just to me totally gotten a little ridiculous. Um, I mean, I think they've requested four continuations now since the, the board requested to have a peer review on the um, 
the boundaries, the spray boundaries that they designated. And um, it just keeps getting kicked down the down the line. And I feel like a deadline on this one would be um, a good idea. And if we don't, if they don't respond that they basically are told it's gonna get a positive determination and they'll have to file an NOI. That seems fair. So I like that. Any other thoughts on this one? Okay, looking for a motion. I move we continue the public hearing for 214 Pomeroy Lane. Whoops, that, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's, a, wrong, that's, the wrong a, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you, uh, caught, you caught Aaron. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, it is the, um, gosh, Central Railroad. I think it's Northeast Central Railroad. Uh, New England Central. Or New England Central, excuse me. All right, I move we continue the public hearing for New England Central Railroad to 623-21 at 7.40 p.m. Second. Second. Okay, Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. Laura? Aye. And aye for me as well. Okay. okay. And so I have 742. So um, we are fine to go ahead with uh, the next one as well. Um, so there was actually two 740s tonight, um, but the first one is being continued anyways. This is for 29 Mill Lane. Um, there was the, the contract for 29 Mill Lane is still being finalized by, the, by procurement. Um, so unfortunately, we haven't been able to start the peer review, but we received the request to continue to um, June 23rd at 7.50. And you're fairly confident, Aaron, that once that gets approved, we'll actually be able to get everything in place by that date? <laughs> I, it's been taking longer than usual to get contracts going because um, our procurement officer that our accountant just retired and so our procurement officer is doing two jobs basically um, so I feel like because the applicant got us a check and they've been very cooperative on the peer review that it would be fair the fairest thing to do would be to continue them to the next available date and then if if we need to continue because the town is unable to complete the contract, then we should continue it from there, I guess. Works for me. Okay. Any comments or thoughts on this one? Okay, looking for a motion. <laughs> I move to continue the public hearing for 29 Mill Lane to June 23rd, 2021 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so a uh, voice vote. Uh, Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Jen? Aye. Uh, who did I miss? Okay, I wasn't looking at my little list. And I for me as well. So I was trying to get my paperwork open for the next one. Okay, so we are good with that one. So we're gonna go on to 740 number two. Um, and this is a request for determination and oops, I already had the right paperwork open. Um, so this is a new one, correct, Aaron? So I need to formally yes, open? Yes, okay. exactly, yep. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31, Wetlands Protection Under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a request for determination from the Town of Amherst for enhancements to the existing parking area at Stanley Street, Wentworth Farm, Kiwanis Field, parking area maps 18A, parcel 16 and 17. So I'm not sure who is presenting this. Is this Aaron or Dave? I think I will, I will start as generally our practice not to have Aaron present town projects, but to, you know, support staff and, and of course, um, advise you on any of these town projects. But so thank you very much. I'm actually joined and um, I, I believe um, uh, the assistant director of conservation and development, Rob Mora, who's also our building commissioner, is going to join me in just a, a second if Aaron could make him 
I think he's in the. Uh, yep, he is being promoted now. In there, he'll join us in just a second. There he is. So welcome, Rob. Thank you. And um, Rob is not only works closely with, with me and, and Aaron, but all of our staff in conservation and development and is also an experienced um, in, in, in building and in uh, construction. So he has been nice enough to assist us uh, with some of these and will be assisting us with some of the design uh, and layout of some of the um, uh, improved parking areas that we're gonna propose this summer. And this was one of them. I'll be very brief, but um, you know, the history of this site is this is uh, the Wentworth Farm Conservation Area off of Stanley Street. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar. This is the jump bridge, the so-called jump bridge parking lot. It is right now uh, kind of a moonscape. It is, uh, it is not a pretty, uh, pretty uh, parking lot at all. Um, it has never been improved in, in my time. Aaron may have some photographs of it. Um, and I'm not sure if you went out and did a site visit for this. Um, but it's an area that we've been looking at for a long time. It doubles as a recreation parking lot for Kiwanis Park, for the recreation field uh, adjacent to it. I was just there the other day on a very busy hot day, uh, um, day over the weekend, and people were parked every which way, sideways. Um, we get fender benders there. We also have quite an erosion problem, um, and I'm sure Rob will talk about kind of what we're proposing to try to address that. But the, all of the drainage from the parking lot actually goes down the trail toward the Fort River and erodes the trail. So let me stop there. I think what we're proposing are really modest improvements. We're not paving anything. We're bringing in um, crushed, uh, crushed gravel and Rob will talk more about that. But we think this will bring order to the parking lot and really make a safer, um, also more aesthetically pleasing approach to uh, Wentworth Farm Conservation Area. So I'll turn it over to Rob. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, I don't know, Aaron, if you could bring back the, uh, the plans, that would yeah. probably be helpful. Sorry, I was trying to get the photos, um, but they, okay. Okay, so we got two sheets here, uh, left side there, a few images, uh, the, the topography plan you can see there in the, the beige color uh, with the, what looks like a little circle at the end of it. Uh, uh, right at the beginning of the trail shown in purple. Uh, these are all images taken from our, our GIS. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the parking area that they've described. That's really rough condition, just uh, uh, compacted gravel that's, uh, you know, doesn't drain very well, ponds quite a bit of water there. There's a couple of raised structures that uh, cars could bottom out on pretty easily. Uh, and then the water just flows right, right towards the, uh, the trail. Uh, eroding uh, several, uh, you know, 10, 15 feet into the, the, to the trail area at least. Um, to, the, to the left is an aerial view showing where we're proposing to delineate uh, a, a better defined parking area. Uh, it doesn't take up the entire uh, length that's shown there uh, in the existing conditions in the gravel, that circular area at the end. Uh, that would be restored back to grass uh, as we've proposed in this project. Uh, down in the last image just shows the relationship to the wetland area, again, as taken off of the GIS uh, that's um, is shown in the blue at the bottom corner of that image. Uh, so if we can go over to the, uh, take a look at the proposed uh, parking plan, uh, there are uh, a number of rocks uh, that are surrounding the parking area right now. It's fairly narrow, so it doesn't provide enough width to uh, properly maneuver a vehicle into a parking space between the existing fence uh, at the property, uh, the adjacent property, 137 Stanley Street, uh, Miss Newman's property, and the, the existing stones that are placed there closest to the, the ball field. Uh, so this would require adjusting those, realigning those stones about uh, seven, eight feet uh, to the south. Uh, to create enough width to, uh, to create standard parking space lengths and uh, some turnaround. Uh, we're gonna wrap the, the stones around the, the parking to uh, prevent uh, vehicles from driving off of the area uh, and try to define a apron. Although it's all uh, pretty wide um, uh, 
gravel right out to the edge of the road, uh, uh, really undefined uh, apron area. So we're trying to define that a little bit better. So uh, the cars parking along the edge of the street won't be able to just drive straight in uh, at the back of a parked vehicle and actually have to turn into the, to the apron. Uh, we're proposing a series of signage, uh, identification signs, uh, no parking signs to the north against Ms. Newman's property uh, and the fence that's existing. Uh, there would be one accessible space uh, at the, uh, uh, I guess it's the southeast corner of the lot where we'll uh, improve the access to the trail. Uh, that last 30 feet or so, uh, which would be new trail uh, access is where the circle is currently existing of, of just gravel. So we'd fill in around that with uh, loam and seed and define a stone dust path uh, to get access out to that trail. Uh, there's, uh, the as Dave mentioned, the uh, water currently runs uh, right down the trail. We're, we're gonna try to uh, cross uh, sheet flow the uh, parking area towards the Southeast corner uh, as shown there. And that's going to require a little bit of carving into uh, the existing uh, topography. Uh, there's a little bit of a mound in that area uh, behind the backstop. Uh, so we'll have to cut into that a little bit. That's why I showed the limit of work a little bit further down than uh, the parking area to just give us um, uh, you know, enough room to get a, a mini excavator in there to, to create the, uh, the flow that's needed out to the, uh, the lower elevation and let it drain naturally toward the wetland. Um, the, the finish of the material, the finish of the parking area will be uh, about six, it'll vary about six to eight to 12 inches, depending on where the, the low spots are now of a, of a processed, inch and a half processed gravel, uh, roller compacted, and then topped off with a, a finer crushed stone that's uh, a little easier to travel over uh, when walking. Uh, and then we'll uh, pay particular attention to the to the accessible parking lot and the uh, access to the trail with um, either a little finer material like stone dust or uh, if that material compacted well enough, that could be suitable, uh, same material could be suitable for uh, those spaces as well. Um, I think that's it. I'm showing the erosion control and the limit of work in the same location. Uh, based on the GIS, it's about 35 feet from the closest point of the wetland boundary. Uh, and uh, yeah, so if there's any other questions, uh, be happy to try to help. I've got one question. You're talking about that parking area being crushed gravel. Is that right? Yes, the, the, the finish would be a crushed stone. How are you going to delineate the spots so people don't just park any place? That's a good question. Um, there, there is a, you know, a, a possibility of painting or chalking the lines. Uh, but the spaces um, typically in these types of parking lots are not painted or delineated uh, other than the signage for the accessible space and the no parking sign for the loading zone. Uh, this is, dem this is uh, demonstrating that there's a proper area uh, width and length for that many vehicles with 10 parking uh, spaces. Yeah, maybe those stones could be used as markers to indicate sort of the line boundaries. I mean, people will just go in there and park where they want to park. That's what I was concerned about. Sure. Okay. They will. If I, if I could add, Brett, I think what we're trying to do is not only improve the condition for, for the people using it to make it safer, safer for people disembarking, for children getting out, for you know families getting out, going to the ball field or going to the conservation area. Um, and I think by doing this to bringing a little bit of structure, we're not talking about paving, we're not talking about a lot of signage or anything like that, but I think new norms will kind of be established there, which even though we won't have a painted, um, you know, like, like parking downtown or something like right. that, I think it does become kind of a norm when you get nose in parking like that, as Rob said, um, you know, new norms are established and people go, oh, I can't park along the Newman's fence, I need to go nose in uh, toward the field. There's a great picture of the current condition and it's, it's just a free for all out there right now. And it is dangerous and all of the runoff goes straight toward the, uh, the trail and toward the Fort River. And so that is, yeah, that is, that's a great picture right there. Um, so again, modest improvement, no paving, um, 
you know, actually, and I, and I think Rob's uh, um, description actually, uh, and, and that was a, a nice feature, which was to, to actually pull it back. So, so we're pulling the parking lot back uh, from the Fort River in this plan by about 35 feet, I think you said, Rob? That's right. Yeah, so. And you know, again, you're, gonna have a, you're gonna have a sign in there saying parking. Maybe you could put a little sign of what the shape of the parking is, identifying the various spots. We will, you know, we will do our best to kind of reestablish norms, as, as Rob said, also by narrowing the entrance. Um, I think it will lessen kind of the free for all of parking. You know, there's parallel parking now. As I said over the weekend, you went in there and people were parked at all different angles. And it's, you know, can be a bit of a free for all there. It really can. So. Well, one option might be spray painting the lines initially for the parking spaces just to get, like Dave said, new norms established so people kind of get used to the new parking pattern. Right. Right. And then after time, you know, they'll figure it out. Yeah. And, if, and if it exceeds 10 spaces, then people need to park over at the Kiwanis parking lot, which is in very nice shape. There's a new kiosk over there and they just have to walk over to the recreation area or to the conservation area. Um, I think this also would improve safety along Stanley Street because we get people parking out on Stanley Street and unfortunately that can be kind of a, a, a fast road and a, and a tough corner. And I'm curious, uh, Johanna Newman is the abutter to the, I guess that would be the north, northeast. And I'm curious um, if she may have comments um, uh, that might help us to kind of guide this, this construction. Yeah, and I do see one hand up and that's probably uh, Johanna. And so I'm gonna, um, I will get to you in just a sec, um, but I wanted to make sure that commissioner, see if Aaron had anything else to add, then go to commissioners and then Johanna will definitely get to you, so. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on Stanley Street and I owned a house there for 10 years. So I know this road and this parking area literally like my back of my hand. And I can tell you that it is hopping in the summertime. And I think this is a fantastic idea. And I know because I witnessed time and time again during storms that material washes from this dirt sandy parking area down that path towards the river. And I don't think it really gets to the river, but even so, it's not ideal. It's carving out this really narrow channel that's hard to walk. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that stabilizing it, pulling back the parking, and also the other thing that this park, this plan does is that there, the currently the um, there, there was a blockade to keep cars from going down there. And that blockade has since deteriorated and, and cars have been driving. I know as of last year, <laughs> cars were driving down to the river. So this will establish like a new barricade to keep cars from accessing down to the river. And um, I think it's an improvement over existing conditions. So I've, I'm in full support of it. Uh, one question I had, I think, for you, Rob, is there's an existing structure there. You have it labeled as a drainage structure. I thought it was a manhole. Maybe that's the same thing. But that's just going to stay as is, and you, you'll just bring it up to that level? That's right. There's two, there's two manhole covers up close to parking space number one, and there's an existing uh, drainage manhole cover just off the, uh, all the way down off the parking in the existing parking but off of the proposed parking lot closest to the end of the uh, area of work. Okay, so they're not actually um, drainage, meaning that they're not draining the parking lot, they're just kind of structures that... No, they're not They're not catch basins okay. or solid covers. There we they'll go. be grading right up flush with them and they'll be left at the surface exposed. Excellent, thank you. Um, so any other questions or comments from the commission? I mean, I think it's a great idea, long overdue. Uh, it's definitely pretty gnarly down there. And Johanna, um, if you have still have a comment, uh, you should be able to speak at this point. Thank you so much, Brett and members of the commission. I'm Johanna Newman, 137 Stanley Street. Um, I really appreciate the abutter notification. We got something in the mail and that's what prompted me about this upgrade. So thank you for doing that part of just engaging the community in our local neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I mostly came on to just hear more about the project. I think um, it sounds really exciting. It sounds, you know, like we're not trying to overdo it or overbuild it, but really just 
kind of make it all work better. I love the idea of pulling it back from the river. Um, I love the idea of making sure cars can't go down there because in the past couple of days, there's definitely been a golf cart frequenting jump bridge. Um, uh, yeah, and then the erosion, you know, there, there's no doubt that stuff gets swept into the river. So it's a step in the right direction there. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions, you know, um, I think last year the town came and took down a bunch of the like big overgrown shrubs right along the fence line. One question that I have is like under this new lot, will the, well, does the gravel kind of go all the way up to the fence line or is there still going to be, I don't know, like a little bit of a no man's land, if that makes any sense between the fence and the parking area. Um, and then my second my second question is, well, the tree that is that you can see just by the dugout, that pine tree is dead. And I wonder if while we have equipment in here and before we put kind of replace the boulders, whether, but you know, I don't know, it seems like the tree warden could maybe just take a look at that and see whether it ought to come down or maybe he already has. Um, and then I guess my last question is, you know, the spot where the puddles is right now, um, I understand that that kind of entrance will be snugged up a little bit to the north side, but is like, are, is that part gonna be filled in with loam and grass as well, just to like reconstitute the idea that like, do not park here or, um, or will it just kind of be left with existing conditions? Those are my three questions. Excellent, Maybe thank you, Johanna. So Dave, Rob? I'll take the tree question. We'll definitely, Johanna, this is Dave. We'll, we'll definitely um, talk to the tree warden and, and uh, Amherst DPW about the uh, pine tree. That's a great, um, uh, that's a great suggestion. Um, Rob may, we'll, we'll talk more about that kind of, uh, that green space between the compacted, uh, the, the current compacted area and your, your fence. Um, I did ask my staff, there's a number of just Random old telephone poles and 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 invasive species kind of between the compacted area and your fence and and we definitely want to clean up get all of those old telephone poles out of there. Those were probably used for parking kind of abutments and we'll get all of those out of there and just kind of neaten up that whole area between us and your fence. And then Rob may be able to talk more about kind of what what does that area look like at the finished product and and then the the entrance. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna clean up that area as Dave mentioned, and I have the edge of the parking, the edge of the compacted uh, crushed stone at five feet away from the fence. Uh, so there'll be a five foot strip of uh, grass when when the project is done in that area, uh, with two no parking signs uh, along that side on the fence side, uh, in that five foot strip. Uh, as far as out on the edge of the road, I think you know that condition can you know easily be um, made better while we're working there. Uh, I, I'll, I'll let Dave give direction on where we go with that uh, in the future. But there there seems to be parking all along Stanley Street back to the uh, the other driveway apron at times. Uh, so I think it's uh, more of a decision of uh, maybe public works and how to treat the road edge there. Uh, so right now in this plan, we don't have any uh, expectation of doing much work outside of uh, okay. the uh, area shown on the proposed plan. Great. I think that's fine. I mean, 10, 10 spaces in that lot, like that'll be an amazing boost in capacity. Okay. So it sounds like you, um, your questions were addressed. Is there anything else, Johanna? That's it. Thanks so much for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, so any other comments or thoughts on this project? So if overall, I, definitely a big improvement. Brad, my only comment, one is to thank Rob, uh, of course, and Erin and for her input. And then, you know, we'd like to keep Johanna and any of the other uh, folks who live on Stanley Street kind of apprised of, of the work and the flow and, and when we're going to get started. And, you know, we kind of welcome their you know, their, their involvement and, and uh, suggestions. So as we go, you know, by all means, Rob will be there, I'll be there, Anne will be there, and Brad and his uh, team will be there. So a lot of this work is gonna be done by town staff. So 
uh, by all means, uh, come and talk to us uh, when, when this gets underway. I can't say exactly when that will be, but um, if the commission is in favor of, of allowing us to move forward, we will get this slotted into kind of a work plan. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Dave. And yes, thank you, Aaron and Rob as well. Any other comments? If not, we're looking for a motion. Uh, I move we issue a negative determination of applicability with conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act and a positive determination of applicability under the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw for the Stanley Street Wentworth Conservation Area parking uh, evolution. I don't know. <laughs> Second. Thanks, Larry. Okay, voice vote. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jen. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. So we are good there. And so Aaron, I assume you will send yourself the paperwork. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on to, um, to the next one, but I think this one's gonna be a continuation. Yes, and Dave, I had sent you an email earlier today, just kind of um, get to get a better idea of um, our meeting on the 23rd is looking to be kind of busy. We've already got nine hearings on that one. Um, and so I was hoping to push that to July 7th, but I wanted to get your um, opinion on that. What, what did my email, my return email say? <laughs> I don't think... I, I don't know if I read it. I don't know if I saw it. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking, Erin. I don't think I responded to you. I, I, I think I missed that email. Um, I mean, 10, 10 hearings on one night. I mean, that's kind of a nice round number. I mean, <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's fine to move it to uh, July 7th. And do we have a time on the 7th, Erin? Um, hold on just one moment. Um, 7.35. Okay. So looking for a motion for continuation to 7.7, So moved. Second. Hey, Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jen. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I from me as well. So that is it for hearings for tonight, but I am I know that there is other business for us to handle. Yes, yes, there is. Okay. Let the fun begin. <laughs> no, um, it's actually not that bad. Um okay. so, sorry, can I just jump in real quick? So there are we have Tofino on the 23rd. The tw yes, the 23rd. Okay. Um just confirming. So that's yeah. why there's so many. Most of them are one. No, I understand. Right, I'm just, but, I'm just confirming. Um, I know. Yeah. But, but there, there are, uh, to, to Brett's point, it is just one applicant, but each application has to be handled separately when we get to the point of either approval or denial or however we do it. That means motions with individual conditions for each permit. So it is going to take some time to motion for each, have conditions for each, and discuss each lot individually when it gets time to actually issue them. So that's why I want to like, when it comes time to actually approve them or, you know, whatever direction the board goes, I want to make sure we have adequate time to deal with each. Yep. And you're optimistic that we'll get there on June 23rd. So I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question on that. So Aaron, remember we were and I don't know if we can talk about this right now or not, but like in the last Tofino hearing, there was an issue with the way, like literally the method that they were using in CAD or ARC to do the buffer around the flags. Yeah. And that's come up multiple times. Yeah. What would really be a bummer if they just submitted that same method for the buffer again, that's clearly not quite right. Right. Um, so is there I, any way, like, how can we anticipate that? How can I, how can we yeah. help? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. Cause I, I did talk to, I did talk to Ted about that and brought that issue up when I brought up the, you know, 
basically we need to have revisions showing um, arts flagging. Yeah. I brought up the issue about the buffer being distorted and I am not sure that it really, how do I say this? Um, that's how they do it. And it was sort of stated to me that that's how, that's how they're going to continue doing it. And it was kind of like, it sounded like that wasn't going to change. So um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I I'm, Sorry, did you have yeah. more? I was trying to think of if there's like an example or if we have a set of plans from like a past project or could ask art to weigh in on like how that buffer is, is drawn from the delineation. Mm -hmm. Cause basically it's like rounding what should be an angle. Right, right. And so you're, you're effectively diminishing the, square footage of the buffer so and that's like technically not correct and mm -hmm. we've seen it done correctly elsewhere right right um so how can we get like technical input on that so it's not like a because I feel like every time we bring it up like there's some head nodding but there's no change <laughs> yeah I agree um can we just, can't we just say no I mean, it's our what policy. Do you have, Larry? Like, oh yeah, I hear you. But I feel like in the last meeting, I was pretty clear. Like, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um. So, I know Ted is planning on submitting like a week in advance of the twenty third. So, like by next Wednesday, I could send him a correspondence before the end of the week and just state that there were, you know, concerns about the accuracy of the buffer and that, you know, um here's an example showing how we would typically see a buffer being drawn off of a wetland and that we would um, like to see the plan revisions reflect that method of um, uh, illustrating the buffer for the plan sets. Um, I, I'm not sure what else, what else we can do. Um, I know Berkshire Design is drawing up the plans. So, I mean, I, I do, I am working with them on something else. So I could potentially bring it up to them directly, just kind of, you know, so that they're aware of it, maybe speaking directly to them, but I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like ways to articulate that. So like if the, if the actual delineation itself is linear, you know, is in right. linear segments, the buffer should not be in curvilinear segments. Right. But actually, Jen, what we have are points. We don't have lines, we have points. Right. And what they do is they draw a buffer off of the points. So I think what they did is a legitimate way of doing it. It's not that it's wrong. It's not the best right. way, it's not the preferred way, but I don't think it's wrong though either. But it is if it means that at some point along that delineation, the space, the linear distance between the delineated line and the interpolation of the point is less than the buffer width. It's less than ideal. Again, I don't, I'm not sure it's wrong and I'm not even sure how much of a difference this is really going to make. I'm just worried it's going to come down to this with buildable area on some of these lots. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you. It's kind of a weird way to do it. I just don't know if technically yeah. it's wrong. Yeah. Um, I it's hear you. Strange. And it's weird that, yeah. And last time Kristen said no, basically this is we did it this way and that's how we're going to do it so well, she like kind of didn't engage on it she's yeah. given the same answers that i've heard i just yeah i went through the recording and yeah and kind of like what aaron was saying they acknowledge that yes this is how we do it and this is how we're going to do it mm -hmm. I, what, I think what, if you're going to say about? anything if you're going to say anything specifically like that and i don't know what the verbiage is but you have to because i'm with brett on this too if you're going to say anything you have to explicitly say what that function is in GIS you know what I mean like how do you how do you change it is that what that makes but I don't think we even need to get into that I think no. that the linear distance between the buffer delineation and the interpolation between the wetland points has to be the required buffer width at all places along the, del yeah. the delineation 
it can't be less. So if they're showing a hundred foot right. offset from the point, it can't be less than a hundred feet at any point on that right. uh, from the point oh. to the buffer line, I think is right. what Jenna's getting exactly. at. And that's, that was my concern with it from the beginning was that it was being interpolated, that the arc was being right. interpolated and there's like it a was setting in there. Exactly. Yeah. So it was in, it was pulling the buffer away from that hundred foot no disturb and who knows what that interpolation would have reflected in maybe loss of 10 feet of the buffer or something like that, but just as it's shown on the plan. But I can, I can express that, ver ask with that verbiage that, and maybe they could put some, some measurements on there showing that hundred foot from the points mm -hmm. in that area or something. Aaron, what's the possibility of you talking upstairs to the state about what's acceptable and what they should perhaps do? I mean, if it's got an engineer's stamp on it or a landscape architect stamp on it, they're the ones who are certifying to it. So I think it's it's not necessarily that level of, of detail. I think on this particular site, it is an issue because the lots are so tight, you know, and um, it's really come down to reducing the square footage of each lot. And um, so it's like get the extra square footage wherever wherever possible kind of thing, which is why it kind of seemed like a red flag to me looking at it. Stretching the rules. So I wonder if there's something in the regulations that would more explicitly state what Jen was saying, where it needs to be X number of feet from the line, not the vertices. I mean, that's the whole issue. It's vertice versus line. Right. Yeah, that's true, um, right? Because it basically like smooths around the vertices rather than staying right. like a consistent width, right? And ironically, there was something that you submitted tonight, Aaron, um, I think for the, um, the previous one where, and I believe you were doing the GIS and it did that same curve thing instead of the line thing. And so there's that was That was a buffer in GIS. So it, that's a well, little different. Okay, so not the one that we're looking at, but in something that you were handing out earlier. I can't remember uh, what I was looking at. Um, but possibly, it was possibly the um, the Stanley Street plan, maybe? Could have been. Yeah, it just was showing kind of like small, isolated, very angular wetland. It was this nice curvilinear type of feature around it. Yeah, I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so so, so it does it does put an put an arc around but the measurement between this point and the farthest line is is 100 feet now that's a buffer off of a line in gis the cad drawing and you know i'm not a cad expert by any stretch of the imagination but the, the way that cad arcs are drawn like let's say you have a um a, a point here mm -hmm. and a point here it's like it it flexes the line in between those two points. So I don't know if it's if it's the same survey, you know, accuracy. But either way, I don't want to get hung up on it too much tonight. Other than to say, I will I will send a correspondence to them, basically noting that this is a big concern and we want it to be accurately reflected on the okay. plan. What the yeah, buffer is. Yeah, let's just kind of leave it yeah. at that. And so that's going to be an outstanding issue. And then. The other one, Jen or Aaron or anybody that I did not necessarily hear resolved was which set of uh, vernal pool regulation. So it's the more stringent one. I assume that's was, but I just didn't hear that final sort of decision. Was that made? I don't think, I mean, I think we articulated as much, but Kristen hadn't seen, Art hadn't issued his re final report yet and Kristen hadn't seen that. So we didn't, I don't think we wanted to like get into that, making that okay. decision and putting Kristen on the spot. Okay. Um, so I think that will still have to be articulated clearly at this okay. hopefully final hearing. Cause that'll yeah. be another outstanding issue that could drag this on a little bit more as well. With right. language definition. Totally, yeah. So under heading, like what can we anticipate now coming mm -hmm. up on this next meeting? <laughs> that definitely applies, yeah. And if yeah, they're and doing their homework, they would at least be ready to present the more stringent one. Yep. Yes. Agreed, Brett. So. Yeah, I'm in agreement with all of what you said. And I mean, I think that Art's final report, it refers directly to our bylaw. Um, but again, that 
and, and our bylaws actually, <laughs> so this is the thing, this is what's interesting. And I've, I've talked to Art about this. Our bylaw actually would allow us to put a hundred foot buffer around the BVW. We can, we could do it from the, from the edge of BVW. We could do it from the edge of hydric soils. You can choose any one of those standards and you can use the greatest extent. Now, do we want to set that precedence? I'm not sure that we do. Um, it could go either way. Honestly, you could, the commission could make that argument, but if it went to superior court, they might throw it out. So I do think that the method that we're using as far as delineating the area of ponding and drawing the hundred foot buffer off of that is the more legally defensible boundary to draw from, um, as opposed to drawing it from the BVW boundary. Um, although the case could be made that the vernal pool species do utilize that BVW around the vernal pool, um, and I think that's why it's written into the, the bylaw like that. Um, I just think that legally speaking, it would be a, a pretty extreme reach of regulation to do that. So it's another, it's another one of those finer points that Ted has argued, like, no, we're drawing it around the ponding versus around the vernal or versus around the BVW. It could go either way under our bylaw, but it's just a matter of the commission's comfort and decision of where you want that boundary drawn from. Okay. Yep. And so we as a commission will need to make some yeah, final decisions on that stuff. So yep. you know, what are we going to do for the next three years? We can be in court. What the heck? <laughs> What's this? I don't so. know what that is. It just popped up on my screen. Aaron, thanks for <laughs> taking the time to like break down the whole process of the Tofino hearings and everything. I'm I apologize for the additional like stress and Hard work to got, we, got, we got to talk. Oh, about it. I mean, I mean, they, that last email that I sent to you guys that I wanted to go through and break it out because I knew that the question was going to be raised that we've held this up. And the reality is I have like 10 emails requesting continuance from Tofino um, from 2019 through to 2020. And I have all those emails. Um, you know, it's just a matter of like, compiling everything, documenting everything. And what's the point at the end of the day, if we're going to be approving it and we're going to be happy with what's been done, then it's a waste of time. So I don't want to like get into the splitting hairs elements of like who's he said, she said, it's like, I just want to get the thing approved. And so we can move forward with our lives. Yeah. I think we all want this one behind us. Yeah. I mean, when I, and when I say get it approved, I mean, approved within the confines of what the law states and what everybody's comfortable with as opposed to just, you know, I, I don't mean in any way like rush it through or something at this point. Of course. Just the yeah. decision being made one way or the other. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So okay. anything else on Tofino? So more not from me, but I'll I'll refer I will relay those messages to Ted. Thank you. And good luck to us all. <laughs> okay, Erin, do you want to move on? Sure. Um, so I, I did meet with the um, owners of 286 West Pomeroy, and um, this was one where the owners are um, doing some um, mowing in the, um, oh, wrong one. Ooh. That's some serious mowing. Uh, you know what, I think I uploaded <laughs> it. To the... <laughs> Yeah, that's well, a different Hampshire one. College one, Erin. That's Hampshire College, yeah. Um, doing some mowing um, it, around a BVW or a, around a well, it's a it's a ver, it's a vernal pool. It's a BVW, and it's also a um, intermittent stream. Uh, let me just because I think I took a bunch. Oh, it, oh, it's in enforcement. Excuse me. A bunch more photos. Um, so I went out and I walked the site with the owners. Um, sorry. Oh, this is a different site. Sorry about that. So this is the one right here. Um, this is the one you went head to head with the master gardener? No, there, you know, um, so this is- They're here. <laughs> They're they're here. Yeah, they're, actually, they're, they're, one, of, one of the one of the owners of the property is here when the time is appropriate. This is it. No. Okay. Yes. So so they they, they do have beautiful gardens. Absolutely, yeah. Fletcher. They have gorgeous gardens. Yeah. There's a. I live in North a, Amherst. I've seen the North Amherst Library. Oh okay. <laughs> 
Um, so th there, there's like a um, sort of a meadow here that surrounds it on either side. And then you can see where there's a clear break in vegetation. Um, the previous photos, this the area down below was all mowed and it had come back with sensitive fern. Um, it actually looked really nice when I was out there. Um, but in speaking with the owner and they did pr submit a correspondence to us, which was in the um, enforcement file. Basically, they have, they've got a, a very substantial poison ivy problem down in that area. They also have a problem with multi-floor rose and um, garlic mustard, I believe. They have like a bunch of invasives Not as well as the, um, I mean, you can see this is the, a photo of the um, poison ivy that's growing along the road and it was sort of taking over. So they, I think, started to just do their spring cleanup and then just kind of, it, it got a little overboard because they were trying to knock some stuff back. This was something that was done by the, the town. They installed this. Um, so this was not work that the landowner had done. Um, but in any case, they did submit this letter to us kind of expressing their their concern um, and that you know they are they express basically that they wanted to do the right thing and that um, they uh, ordinarily do only mow the meadow around the um, the wetland they don't typically go into the wetland but that they did because of the invasive species that were starting to take over in there and um, I guess kind of wanting guidance from the commission as far as what you guys would recommend for the future with the multiflora rose and with the poison ivy sort of they're, they don't they're not using pesticides herbicides anything like that to knock it back they've just been hand pulling it um, and this time around they they I think weed whacked it or something um, to knock it back um, just Okay, and you were saying that the um, the owner is here, so that's Sharon Roglowski. Rogalski. Uh, yes, yes, that okay. is Sharon. Yep. And so Sharon, um, at this point, you should be able to speak. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yes. And if there's anything you'd like to add, um, I I think Aaron covered it, and I I just appreciated the opportunity to put my thoughts in writing in terms of, um, you know, the fact that we've been here 32 years and um, trying not, not trying to do any harm. Mm -hmm. um, my husband did get carried away. I try to <laughs> keep him at bay, which is a challenge. Um, I've made it very clear that I'm now the boss and he has to listen to me um, because I'm, I hate wasting your time and putting you through this and putting us through this. Um, yep, and we can just think of it as a learning experience. So thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, um, so commissioners, thoughts, suggestions? Um, none of us like poison ivy, none of us like multi-flora rows. So we definitely are sympathetic with those issues. But um, there's definitely issues with once people start to get yeah, definitely within a wetland. And then also once they get within certain buffers of the wetland. And so in general, we request people to stay out um, 30 feet from the wetlands, um, from the buffers. So, and those are generally a no touch zone for us. Um, and you know, if people are going to get closer than that, then we ask them to, you know, come before us and we can kind of talk about what needs to happen in there. So I live close to them, and I've, I've, I, I've known the experience of this place for the 30 years she's talking about. And they generally have done a good job of trying to maintain things. There's clearly problems in terms of trying to, the invasive species and so forth are there. Uh, they don't seem to over, overload the system. They seem to take a lot of respect for the system. Um, and it looks nice. Mm -hmm. as, Brett, as Brett has said before, looking nice isn't necessarily the best attitude, but it is, it is a reasonable place. So, and I, I think um, to to the point that the, the point about the no touch zone, I think that raises a question, um, which is they've been maintaining this um, meadow around the wetland, which 
is full of wildflowers and things. And so they've been mowing it a couple times a year around there to because mowing it helps the wildflowers to come up and that's pollinator habitat. Mm -hmm. So, and if it's left to its, you know, if it's left and there's a 30 foot no touch there and we already know there's invasives coming up that, that those invasives are gonna creep up into that meadow <coughs> and yep. affect that pollinator habitat that's been established. So I think the, the landowner is wanting to do the right thing but also sort of has this established ecosystem there and wants to know sort of what's okay and not okay in terms of like maintaining that existing meadow. And then I know like on other projects that we've, we've dealt with recently, um, hand pulling of invasives has been acceptable. And if soils were disrupted with hand pulling, then we've asked to have like a wetland seed mix or conservation seed mix put down, but that we've asked for non-mechanical means of removal of the invasives. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know if this is just sort of general guidance we want to offer them or if we want to sort of set boundaries and say, we'd like for you to stay out of this area or that area. I like basically what you propose there. And the only other addition I add to that is non-chemical. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as it's, you know, as long as the landowner does understand what the invasives are, it sounds like they do. Not everybody does, but it sounds like they definitely do. Um, as long as it is non-mechanical, as long as it is minimal disturbance to the soil, as long as there's no chemicals, uh, I think that's pretty good. Granted, poison ivy is native, but I'm no fan of poison ivy, so I'm okay. <laughs> Granted, it has good wildlife value, truthfully. I mean, it has berries and other stuff, so I'm being very anthropogenic, anthropocentric on that, but so be it. Yes. So, I mean, um, I guess, do we want to issue a correspondence sort of outlining those general parameters? Like that those are what our recommendations are as far as the invasives are concerned. And just obviously that mowing in, in the wetland itself is um, definitely not something that we would, you know, that by regulation is an alteration of the resource. And so just mm -hmm. to stay out of that area with mechanical means. Yep. And so is it, it obvious? Is it, is it I, I, who's going to talk? I was going to say, I think it's a good idea because in fact, they're long-term landowners. They've been there a long time. And I think it's good to maintain that dialogue between us and the town or between mm -hmm. them and the town. Okay. Well, is it pretty obvious? I'm sorry. I didn't see all the pictures again. It's the wetlands obvious. It's just the, that depression. Yes. It's yes. that depression. boundary it's, is it's very obvious. clear. Yeah. It's, it's that obvious. depression. It's mm -hmm. obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the other thing I'm kind of feeling a couple ways here. Is, I mean, is demarcation, but I don't think that's necessary here. But I mean, if there are, you know, if this continues to be an issue, then demarcation could be another option. But I don't see that as necessary. You know, right, right, right near there is where the uh, the the, uh, the pond in, and Pond View Drive drains out over to the Fort River. Now it's some of it's underground in that process going through there, but right, right to the right, just right across the street is the 10th green of, of uh, the golf course. And so obviously the river is over there and this, it, and I think it goes underground in some place right across, the, it goes underground under the road. But this is clearly an area where there's been long-term flowing. So there, there are in fact two streams. Um, there is a, and and there's there's multiple culverts. Um, there is Larry is absolutely right, and that's sort of a whole nother issue which um, I spoke to the landowners about. Um, so um, there's this small culvert which um, is. Uh, immediately in the little vernal pool that was that was initially mowed and then there's I believe further down there's actually an an intermittent stream and I don't I don't know that that's the same brook um I think that that one actually might be further but um the reason that I say that is because so this this one the culvert is pretty much blocked and there was like, there was zero flow in it where I've seen that little stream behind Pondview Drive, there's actually 
a good a good flow of water through it. Um, so I'm just the not sure if it's the, the same. Water Markers, pond, Markers Pond flows down through there, and I, I've got to go down there and look myself to see where it goes under, where it goes culvert-wise yeah. across the road, because that that pond that that stream runs all the time, 24 hours a day, all the, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. David, Dave knows where that, there you go. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I want to kind of put this a little bit in context from where, where, where I'm at, which is, you know, um, we, we have a landowner who's had very good discussions with Aaron out in the field. Mm -hmm. I think no. um, we have a good framework for Aaron to right. communicate with that landowner. I think we just, I would caution, we, <laughs> Not to make this into, you know, the culverts are, are something I think related but separate. Uh, the landowners have not done anything to the culverts. We may need to address that from a public safety standpoint because if the culverts are bought, that area of, of Pomeroy Lane has flooded in the past. But I think that's a much bigger issue. I'm just trying to keep it within the framework here. I'm also very sensitive to Erin's time because these enforcement uh, issues do consume a lot of her time. and. I think we need to keep it kind of in relative perspective. We want to reserve her time for some right. of the, as much of it as possible for the bigger issues. But I think the Rogalskis, you know, have come at this uh, uh, with an open mind and and kind of yes, we we uh, we went a little too far, but uh, we we want a little guidance, and Aaron can provide that through some of the comments here and correspond with them in writing. And then um, you know, it's a very prominent site, and I'm sure they will. Uh, you know, uh, my hope is that they will. Uh, stay within those guidelines for as long as they own the house. Yeah. I've been watching that site for 55 years. <laughs> and I also just want to support the other thing that Aaron was saying earlier that I'm in support of active maintenance of the meadow that's already been maintained. I think that's important for a number of reasons. Yeah, ditto. Okay, um, so I think that we've kind of hashed this out. Um, Aaron, do you have the specific conditions and then we can make a uh, a motion um, for this enforcement order? Yeah, so I think just generally speaking that the, um, so it's not actually an enforcement order, it's, but just- Oh, this is just a correspondence. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. you're right. I'm sorry. So um, I, I'm going to pull okay. that back. And so, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm sure you have all of that recorded. So. But just that we, the, the commission supports the maintenance of the pollinator wildflower meadow that's around and that's been historically established around that wetland for its ecological value um, that we would not support mowing of the wetland itself but um, would support hand pulling of invasive species um, within the wetland and if that causes <laughs> soil disturbance that there should be seeding to stabilize that area um, as far as poison ivy, I um, that's a whole nother question, how you guys wanna deal with the poison ivy issue. Um, it, I mean, if they're mowing the wildflower garden that or the wildflower area there, that will keep the poison ivy somewhat at bay, but it's, it's coming up the road, it's climbing up all the trees. It's, um, it's very, very heavy in that entire wetland complex. I know from my property. <laughs> The poison ivy things, yes. Yeah. I mean, again, poison ivy is native. It's doing. I know. I, know. I know. You know, it's it's going after the trees, as you know. I mean, I, anyway. it's what's supposed to do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I mean, we can just kind of leave it at that and not address the poison ivy, or just let the regular maintenance of the meadow address the poison ivy issue. Um, yeah, I think we should do that. It is native. Otherwise, okay. it just becomes sort of a blurry line, uh, even okay. though I would love to see it out, but uh, okay. I don't think we can. There's only, you got like goats or hand pulling. Right. Goats. And then you got, that, but goats are going to eat everything. So it's like right. pointless. Or triclopyr, which you say no chemical, but triclopyr would be the best one. Just It works. I, I would want if people are going to start using chemicals, if they just kind of come in front of us formally, and then we can do that. But otherwise, yeah. Hand pulling. So hand, yeah, so hand pulling is still okay. Like that's, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that that's clear to me and I can draft a correspondence to respond to the okay. Rogalskis that basically outlines that and request that in the future, they kind of follow those parameters. Okay, great. 
Um, okay. And if the homeowner has any questions about that, yeah, please get in touch with Aaron and we'll resolve those. So thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Um, please. Somebody mentioned goats. Was, is that an option <laughs> or was that a joke? <laughs> oh, goats work. They just... But not not in a wetland, though. <laughs> so yeah, goats are that, great for taking care of invasives, but, but we don't want them anywhere okay, near yeah. the wetlands. Though. I, I yeah. didn't think so. Non-discriminatory, and they trample everything. Yes. Yeah, I I didn't think so, but I had to ask. <laughs> All they right. love poison ivy. Yeah. Yes, I heard. Yep. I knew that. I and knew then that. everything else. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's clear. And and thank you. That's very helpful. It makes sense. We're very appreciative. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night. You Take too. Care. Okay. Um, Next one, Erin. Yeah. So coming back to um, my, oops, excuse me, just get queued up here where I was. Um, so the other one is the 121 pond view and and Dave and I did talk about that one. Um, I'll just what I'd like to do and I think what Dave and I kind of thought would be the best approach here um, was to issue a correspondence to the landowner and I'm going to call and speak to them about it before this correspondence goes out but just kind of um, discussing with them what they're doing on the property, um, that they have to pull back some of the pathways that they've been creating um, and some of the work that they've done on the bank of the stream has to be restored, plantings or seeding done. Um, and that basically if they want to proceed with some of the things that they've, that they've moved forward with, particularly like the, the um, uh, unpaved pedestrian walkways, I'll call them, that are closer than 50 feet to the stream that they have to file permits to proceed with that. Um, and if they replace the, the stream crossing, they're gonna have to file permits for that. Basically just to kind of reel in some of the activities that have been going on, tell them kind of where the law states specifically what they can and can't do, and then where they need to file permits in the future if they wanna do work and just, hopefully we can resolve it that way. And if, if that um, can address the situation, then great. If not, then we'll take it from there as, the, as time goes on. Um, I think we're at a position where he just, he just doesn't know what, he's, what the rules were. And he's trying to take care of property that he thinks he makes it look nice for himself, but he just has to know the rules. And he'll, mm -hmm. he'll, I think he'll follow things fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that that's just the way, a, it's, it's Pondview Drive, not Pondview Lane. Oh, excuse me, Pondview Drive. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I support Aaron in this approach. I do think time will tell, Larry. I'm not as convinced be. as you. I, I think um, this is this is kind of up watershed upstream of, of the, the 286. So um yeah, I, I think I think we had a really good site visit with the with the landowner, and and I think Aaron is spot on and um, I think sending a, a, a well well referenced and re well researched letter to them would be great. But if you know, and we may we may plan a site. I think we should plan a site visit out there again in the fall um, to really say, okay, um, what's happening out there, and 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 do kind of a a trust but verify type situation. So I think it's fine. So. Mm -hmm. And if it's okay, Brett, I'd like to get your signature on that letter. Um, and so I could potentially work, just go through that with you offline, um, sort of the specific wording, if you're comfortable with that. Works for me. Okay, great. Um, Do you want me to handle the 61A? That would be, that would be great if we're ready for that. We're, well, we're actually not ready for a full presentation on it. Okay. Um, I didn't know it was really on the agenda other than, um, has the, I presume commission members have seen the correspondence from the owners, the Mitchell family? It was included in packets, but I don't think we've reviewed it uh, in a open session. I think, I think what what I would prefer to do is come back in two weeks and have a presentation. I know in the past, Aaron, you've done a little write-up on these, which I think was very effective. But 
In short, the Mitchell family, which is a longtime farming family in North Amherst, they own land between Route 63 and um, Sunderland Road in North Amherst, the core of uh, uh, North Amherst. They have submitted a Chapter 61A right of first refusal. So in short, they are proposing to take their land out of Chapter 61A and uh, sell it to a potential development. The development is, is uh, what is being called the Eruptor Project, which is a, a research and development project that is being proposed for North Amherst with uh, connections to the university and, and some national uh, funders um, uh, are, are behind this project. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, is typically what we do and Aaron has done in the past is do kind of a write up of the natural resources of the property uh, streams, wetlands, um, you know, potential crossings, that kind of stuff. It's about 18, 18.5 acres, something like that. I can't remember the exact number, but it's 18 to 19 acres. Um, historically farmland. I happen to grow up uh, adjacent to the farm, um, so I know it quite well. But um, the question for us is or the, what's before the commission is typically what is asked by the town council is for the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board to make a recommendation as to whether the town should exercise our right of first refusal. And what exercising means is would the Conservation Commission and or the Planning Board recommend the council step in and attempt to buy the land for the, uh, um, so essentially you're, the town is being asked, do you wanna step into the purchase and sale agreement and buy the land for some other purpose? And in, in the case of the CONCOM, you would, we could have a discussion in two weeks about the natural resources on the site, the purchase price, and is it a priority? And I just, I'm not saying it is, but is it a priority for conservation? And I think that's what would happen in two weeks. So I would, I would ask you to take so, a look at that purchase and sale agreement between now and then. So just a question, Dave. I actually, I looked at this one, I believe. It was in our packet, right? It was sent over? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, let's say we decided that it was an area that we wanted to preserve. Where does the money for that come from? Well, if so, so really that would be up to the council. If the conservation, are you saying if we, do you mean the conservation commission? Yeah. Or the, yeah if the conservation yeah. commission said, this is an important site for X, Y, and Z reasons. And we would like to execute that, that purchase option. So, so you don't, you as a body don't really have that power, only the town council does. So Got it. you are simply being asked to make a recommendation, Got it. Got it. yes okay. or no, to the council. And then the Understood. council makes that under, under advisement. Um, and uh, they would probably invite a representative from the commission to come to the meeting where they, where they consider it. The okay. money... The money could come from CPA dollars. It could come from free cash. It could come from any uh, available funding that the uh, the town has. I believe the purchase price is, is 1.6 million for 18 or 19 acres. And that's all spelled out in the purchase and sale agreement in the packet that uh, Aaron shared with you. So. Which parcel again was that? I, I looked at it two weeks ago and I forget. Um, I don't recall the parcel number myself, um, but it Where is, is it? in, it's in North Amherst off of Route 63 in Sunderland Road. So it's past there, Mitchell Lane there? Or before? Uh, Mitchell Lane, you mean on Route Their 63? driveway? Yeah. It is, it is that parcel right there. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, the, the, the whole Mitchell Holdings are somewhere in the order of 35 acres. They're only proposing to sell 18 of the... 30 plus acres there. So what's so an eruptor? What's eruptor development? An eruptor is the name of the project that they're proposing. It would be an R&D, uh, a research and development uh, building, a uh, high tech building where they would do, you know, um, um, uh, development and, and potentially some fabrication, um, you know, um, in association with the university. Huh. It's a really, Fletcher, there's a ton, they've already put together their whole like website and stuff. There's a bunch out there that's, it's really, and it's an interesting project. Oh, it's up there? Okay, I'll look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Eruptor development? Erup just, if you look up Eruptor project, um, I think it, I think that's what I did to find Quite it. Quite a provocative name. It is, yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, 
next, uh, what's with the last one, Erin? I can't remember on your agenda. Oh, Hampshire College. Yeah, so um, Hampshire College contacted me because they had a student that um, had done some work on their property without their permission um, and put together this like really weird, funky um, little fort type thing out on the back of their land. And they contacted me, basically they wanted to fill the hole and seed it down. And um, I said that that would be fine. Uh, this is how it looks right now. So I just wanted to let you guys know that I guess it was a student who was just kind of going going off on their own and <laughs> not communicating with the university on this work. Is it definitely in a wetland resource area? It, no, it's it not in water. a it's not in a wetland. Um, there there is wetland um, that so it's at the outer extent of a hundred foot buffer zone um this this area is so they wanted to just before they filled it and seeded it and disposed of this material they just wanted to communicate this to us mm -hmm. looks and, like and a little like foot bath yeah i'm not or sure maybe, no, it's a mosquito experiment i think really it, right and they, of course, will make sure not to fill the hole with the tires, but remove the tires. Yeah, they're and they're making the student pay for the disposal and the um, restoring of the full restoration of the site. Um, and I can I can actually I'd be happy to go out and take a look at it once the site has been restored, just to make sure that it's seated and um, based on. I mean, based on their emails, Aaron, I think they are on top. Like it seemed to me, like the Hampshire College people were like. Oh my god, you know, and yeah, and they I were pretty know. disturbed by it. Your schedule is so packed. Like, I don't know if other folks have a thought, but in my mind, I they seem to really be on top of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I it's agree with that a hard goal for yeah. our jurisdiction, anyways. So yeah, okay. as long as they're resolving it, yeah. I'm yeah. Good. Okay. And Let's thank really you want for to. letting us know. Okay. Um, so we received a request for certificate of compliance for 29 Hawthorne which is um, actually part of the sort of Tofino Amherst Hills development. But this lot is 100% outside of CONCOM jurisdiction. It was just part of the original subdivision. So um, it's got the red X on it, but as you can see, it's, it's in an upland area. So as a matter of course, this is just to release the um, the order of conditions off of that lot, which is outside of our jurisdiction. Um, I would recommend that we issue a certificate of compliance on it. Yep, makes sense. So unless there's any discussion, looking for a motion. I move we issue a certificate of, oh, sorry. I was just gonna go for it. Am I good to go for it? Okay, uh, motion we issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 89-432 at 29 Hawthorne Road in Amherst. Second it. Thank you. So thank you. So Leroy, your vote. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Larry. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I for me as well. Okay. Um, okay, so these should be our last two items tonight. Um, minor administrative change requests. The first is for 51 East Pleasant Street. Um, and this is the um, old Bertucci's parking area. So the first request is um, basically they 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 had an established um, treatment um, invasives program in their order of conditions, and they hired on um, an uh, licensed applicator from SWCA to do the the herbicide treatment on the Japanese knotweed that is in the, um, it's, it's on the banks of the tan brook there. Um, and basically what they're recommending is a change to the invasive treatment plan based on the um, uh, licensed applicators recommendations. So um, that's spelled out here, but basically what had been previously recommended was that they in the fall cut and then do um, treatment of the of each individual um, sort of stump sprout 
um, from the Japanese knotweed, but that what they're saying is that they recommended a foliar spray um, when the uh, Japanese knotweed is flowering in late June and July, and then that they do the, the cutting and further application later, um, and that they also requested they didn't want to put the plant plantings in until year three because they want to um, repeat this treatment again um, when it leaves out again um, to try to just eradicate it from that area of the brook as much as possible. Um, so that is the request, part of the request. The second part of the request was that they, um, they hadn't proposed removal of the curbing um, along the edge of the parking area um, that goes up against the Tanbrook. There's a, there's a curb at the edge of the parking area and they basically requested permission to um, take that curbing out and put a new curb there because it's, it's all broken. And the concern is that um, as they continue to have snow plows in there and stuff that the material is going to continue to break up and that it's going to eventually end up in the brook and that they want to take that broken curbing out and get the commission's blessing to do that. Um, there's a lot of other issues on that site that we discussed. We discussed sort of at length with numerous parties. Um, the, the stream itself, if you ever walk down and take a look at it, it looks like for decades they have been pushing snow into the tan brook and as a result there's a significant quantity of well debris there's a lot of trash and stuff but also um, sediment has been pushed down and so the channel of the stream is nearly filled in with sediment and then the stream has been pushed over to the side so where the stream ordinarily would flow directly into the culvert now it's pushed right and it's not even flowing into the culvert it's flowing to the side like at one of the head walls of the culvert and they really want to have a conversation with us about restoring this restoring that section of the tan brook in the future and i think that that would be a really worthwhile conversation to have not tonight but in the future and they just want to address this tonight yeah, that sounds great because that little section of brook is disgusting and so yeah it's sad. yeah um with the curbing are they just planning to replace it with kind the same kind of curbing that's already there i don't remember right that, basically but. in kind replacement of the existing curbing um, they just want to remove the broken curbing. Okay. And then does this treatment make sense to you or Fletcher, do you see any issues with this treatment? No, I think it's great. <clears throat> I appreciate them actually waiting three years too. It's actually, they're going to really try, <clears throat> try to make it work. Okay. Yeah, the applicator seemed to really know what she was talking about. I asked her a lot of questions on site and this seemed like a good approach. So. Yeah, seems reasonable to me. Do any of the other commissioners have thoughts or concerns? Kudos? I was going to say kudos, and, and I would love to hear what the, the expert said, because we get so many questions about treatment. It'd be great to kind of have a, we've talked about this before, about having like a set of recommendations, you know, like try this for a couple of years. And then well, this is really helpful for Japanese knotweed in particular. So I'll yeah. hold on to these recommendations in case we run into this in the future with like a site that needs to be, um, you know, have, inv have invasive treatment for right. Japanese knotweed. Cause I think it's, it's. Um, well, Cause we did down on route nine, right? Like down or down, like that site. The, the um, uh, mass DOT site. Yeah. 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 I think they ended up not doing anything because they found it to be useless. Yeah. So. Well, and also private property, like there's issues with the right of way and yeah, they're just, right. it's like a losing battle they feel like, so. Anyway, I was, yeah, I was just thinking cause we do, it comes up often. It'd be great to have a set mm -hmm. thing that we can share. Yep. Okay, so any other sort of thoughts or comments on this one? I don't think we need, so um, this is just administrative. Do you want a motion on this, Erin? Yeah, I would make a, Okay. If you if you're comfortable, I'd make a motion to approve this as a minor administrative change to the order of conditions mm -hmm. for 51 East Pleasant Street. Well, I'll make the motion to uh, make minor administrative changes to the curbing <laughs> and the invasive plant control at 51 East Pleasant Street. 
Second. Okay, voice vote. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. And aye for me as well. Anything else tonight, Aaron? Yes, we got one more. Thank one you more. for your patience. I know this is a lot. <laughs> Oh, okay. this, one is, this one's a very easy one, though. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had approved um, a single family home site um, on Paley, Paley Village Place. Um, you might recall this. They're, they are proposing actually to move the house slightly away from the wetland to make it more of a ranch style home and to push it closer to the road in order to accommodate um, a child that is special needs. And so the construction um, has special ADA compliance requirements. And so this again would be a request for a minor administrative change to the existing order of conditions with the adjusted um, change to the house footprint. Cool. Looks good. Looks like an improvement for, yeah, the uh, wetland conditions. And then, yeah, obviously for ADA issues, that sounds great. Uh, anybody have any comments or thoughts on this one? Okay, so looking- I'll make a motion Thank to um, approve the mine. You call it, we're calling these minor administrative change to yep. uh, the Pally Village Place home, moving it Closer to the road. Second. Okay. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Okay. Is that the last one? I think that was the last one. That's all um, I've got. Thanks yep. for that. 901. Thank you, and, <laughs> yeah, thanks for pushing us right along. So we're looking for one final motion then. I move to adjourn this meeting at 9.02 p.m. Second. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Aye. From me as well, we are officially adjourned. So thank you, everyone. Have a thank great night. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, <laughs> as always. Um, Aaron?